Um, it, I know it's a topic all four of you all think about in many different ways. Uh, we did a recent study looking at the carbon footprint of, of data centers globally. We came to about 2.5 billion tons uh, cumulatively by 2030. It was much bigger than we expected. Daunting. At the same time, you know, Lisa, you mentioned on the positive side, AI could benefit in so many ways. It could help with grid management. It could help with material science to improve battery technology. It could do so many things. Let's, let's start on an optimistic side of things. Uh, for, for any of you all, where do you see the biggest promise of AI in terms of helping with the energy transition? And then we can talk about some of the, the thornier problems. But what technologies are you most excited about in, in AI? Where, where should we start? Would it be on the demand side? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I can start. I, I like that long pause uh, when you ask for something positive about AI. That was a, that was a bit tense. But I think that uh, kind of to what I said earlier and what Greg said, the demand modeling side, so positioning of new power sources. Um, you know, there's an enormous amount of data out there. You know, to your point about the grid status website, you can see the US, whole US grid. You can derive insights from kind of locations of power that you need to make power use and power supply, you need to make assumptions um, about where there are going to be new demand centers, how many people are going to have EVs, how many people are going to have heat pumps, how many people are going to have batteries. So you need, I think, you know, the, the data um, ingestion and analysis with the application of subject matter experts in the power space who understand kind of how these things work and have worked. That is a really interesting kind of application. If that you know, is more machine learning than kind of just pure AI, it's I think that machine learning specifically, you know, the application of subject matter expertise to the problem. You, know, you see a lot of companies that are kind of using it to um, model potential outcomes for different catalysts that could be more energy efficient, for example. And instead of right. um, having to continue, you know, make a new catalyst recipe. I'm not a scientist, you can tell. And, and then um, I put it, put it into the test. You can iterate based on machine learning kind of what is going to happen if you were to produce it, which massively reduces your cost of production. So I think there's a lot of different applications. But I would say that where I feel most comfortable is in that machine learning space rather than the just general AI. But I think that's where, you know, hopefully, after this mania of generating faster and faster and smarter and smarter AIs is kind of somewhat calmed, we will get to the stage where people are then able to utilize it you know, with subject matter expertise to answer some of the really difficult questions, one of which is demand, uh, you know, power demand or power supply, power location, and the other is just so many different aspects of the transition. You know, one of the things that's really spiked people's interest in fusion recently is that you know, supercomputers mm -hmm. and that kind of iterative power of modeling has enabled people to test a lot of scenarios much faster and much more cheaply. Uh, not cheaply enough and uh, not necessarily fast enough, but we're getting there. So that kind of accelerated trend, I think, is very exciting. That's a good point. I mean, material science for the energy transition, I, I think many investors don't appreciate how close of an analogy that is to drug discovery and how powerful that's been on drug discovery. Very similar problems in a lot of ways, essentially complex molecular problems where you need to test thousands of candidates to figure out the right catalyst, the right electrolyte, et cetera. That's, that's a big deal. We haven't yet seen a lot of progress, but I expect we probably will. It's a, it's a really good point. You know, I'd say we see parallels, you know, to your drug discovery example. We see ingredient discovery on the food side. We see um, supply chain sourcing on just general trade and sort of supply chain side, where if you're going to have disruptions, whether it's from weather, whether it's from, you know, climate or geopolitical or war or whatever, being able to rapidly adjust your product to, hey, all of a sudden I can't get this ingredient. I need a replacement. What's the best replacement for it? AI is helping people respond to a lot of that stuff much more quickly. And so um, I think there's just a lot of innovation that's happening, but also just resilience that's coming out of it. Rena. So I'd say for better or worse, I think it just the energy transition is going to be sped up by AI. So both kind of the increased demand for power on one hand and then lowering the cost of clean technologies on the other. Thank you for waiting like 20 minutes, right? <laughs> I've been making this joke at sort of all the sustainability conferences this year that, you know, it's a good party game. You could, at these events, you could take a shot every time somebody <laughs> says AI. And then I say, don't do that because you'll die. You know, um, but the reality is I think one, one positive is that these hyperscalers, you have a basically a patient, long-minded, yes. deep-pocketed seed investor you know, for something like sort of, you know, civil nuclear, right, which might take seven or 10 years to sort of be effective, like who else is going to have the patience and the money to, to wait for that that way and then, and then create it for everybody else? It's a really important. We have so many technologies that are in that valley of death where we need patient capital, to your point, Marina, and that's 
that's always been very tough. And these days, especially, you know, utilities are very nervous yep. about putting a lot of capital into new nuclear for good reason, by the way. The history has not been, been phenomenal, but we need patient capital to get us over that hump. And it is exciting when we look at nuclear technologies. The unit cost could drop if we have that patient capital, but we need to start uh, very quickly. It's incredibly encouraging just in the last month to see the number of nuclear announcements involving the technology sector.